What's up guys, Dr. Mo here, digital nomad physician at digitalnomadphysician.com. I hope you guys can hear me okay. I'm in another bedroom in the beautiful um, 29 Palms uh, house here at, near Joshua Tree. <clears throat> so one of the conversations that I have, I'm, I, I like being active on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a very cool website. Uh, Doximity is supposed to be the same for physicians, but I don't want to box myself in only communicating with other physicians when it comes to um, stuff, when it comes to healthcare, because there's only so much you can learn from another physician because many of us have very similar perspectives. But I, I find that when you communicate with other people in other industries, the financial industry, transportation industry, you know, everything else in between, there is a lot you can learn. And there's some really interesting takes on stuff uh, from personal experiences that people have. Physicians, for example, we, if we are ever a patient, we still look at the experience from the, per, from the lens of a physician. It's hard for us to really detach and become the patient. But other individuals who are still working on healthcare and are not physicians can still do that. And I find that to be interesting. Um, uh, actuaries and people who or underwriters and insurance contractors, etc. They have a really interesting perspective. It's good to be there. It's good to be on LinkedIn. I tried Doximity in some ways. The conversation sort of <laughs> didn't meet my guidelines, I guess. I, I've, I've said it like that. I, I think they quickly degenerated down into something where I'm like, oh, I don't really want to be in that conversation. I don't think I would have anything to add and I don't think it would. I would learn a lot from it. I'm sure there's a lot of great conversations going on, but that's Doximity and I think um, LinkedIn is for someone like me who wants to, I like healthcare, I understand Western medicine, I want to expand, I want to go to a different, um, completely different aspect of it, right? So the reason I bring all of this up is because some of the conversations that go on, the thing also is that a lot of people get sound bites and they hear a lot about what medicine is, what medicine is doing, what medicine is doing wrong, and they hear it from other people. For example, when a physician does do something wrong, it's very easy for the media to hang that physician. But when a physician hears that same situation, it's very easy for the physician to be like, yeah, I could totally see how that could happen to me, and I'm a good physician, and everybody's saying this is a bad physician, um, cutting off the wrong leg, um, giving the wrong medication, giving a medication to a patient who's clearly anaphylactic to that medication, not getting a urine test on somebody who could be pregnant and missing an ectopic pregnancy or much worse. But the problem is it's not that easy, right? And so <clears throat> that's just the clinical aspect. And as as a, as a me as a physician who's on LinkedIn and hears some of these conversations and get involved in some really great discussions, by the way, great discussions to be had on LinkedIn, a lot of learning there. Sometimes people forget that, hey, you actually have to be a physician. For example, out of everybody whom I can think of, only a physician knows what it's like to live in the ecosystem of an EMR. I don't care if you design an EMR, you've never had to think about the care of a patient and figure out the prescriptions and navigate an EMR to, to begin interacting with a patient and then discharge the patient. I don't care if you're a nurse, uh, an, an RN, I don't care if you're a medical assistant, you've never had to deal with what we have uh, had to deal with. I would say physician assistants and nurse practitioners are on that same level, so basically I would say I don't want to say clinicians because I'm it's like everybody these days actually considers themselves clinicians. Everybody does, but like really it's just a you know, the people who are in these physician roles. I don't know what else to say, doctor roles. And I, I mentioned that because so a lot of conversations come up about an intelligent EMR. The point of the EMR was to allow the physician to have access to all the disparate um, aspects of the cl patient's clinical journey. If the patient was seen at an outside institution, they got one medication here, another surgery here, they already had the MRI done, you don't need to repeat a lot of that stuff or you can bring that in and put the pieces of the puzzle together. They had a previous sudden uh, spike in their uh, LFTs and that went back down. Well, you know, are you sure you're not missing, uh, you know, episodic congestive heart failure that maybe recovered, maybe a previous... Um, uh, you know, autoimmune hepatitis that resolved on its own or something like that. So having access to that information is critical, but that never happened, right? That was kind of the promise of the electronic medical record, but it really became a way to document the journey of the patient for the purpose of billing and, of course, for 
in some ways also keeping tr- tabs on the physician and you know lawsuits and malpractice. So it did. It I think let a lot of physicians down. So when I have discussed this in the past, and I said an, an intelligent EMR is necessary, some people, of course, will come back and say, well, the EMR is already quite intelligent. It, can, um, it flags you when you write a medication that interacts with another medication. Any physician listening to this will know that, like, yes, you also get flagged for a thousand other things that are completely irrelevant. How many patients have we had on Flexeril and, uh, and SSRI? And all of a sudden, every patient on Flexeril and SSRI gets flagged, right? And so now we have to go back and do that. Same with uh, Zofran and other medications. Same with um, a patient who has had a rash in the past as a child, a very mild rash on amoxicillin. Now, every time I want to prescribe uh, some sort of a beta lactam antibody, uh, antibiotic, I have to deal with the same kind of thing. So I just click close, 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 just so I can finish this and go to the next one. The, the time limit that we have is so constrained and the amount of focus that we have is so limited that in, it is not an in, this is not intelligence on the EMR's part. Other people will say that, hey, what are you talking about? Like, uh, uh, intelligent EMRs are right around the corner. Look at uh, chat GT3, whatever that thing is called, and how intelligent it is and how it can c- converse with a patient. I understand that, but I think an intelligent EMR for, from a physician's perspective is the kind of electronic medical record where you see the patient, they come into you, right? You have the, you finish the conversation, you're talking to the patient, and then you take some time to jot down certain things, perhaps even from the intake when the patient gets on the app and adds in the symptoms that they were complaining about, maybe even from the medical assistant who checked the patient in and added some other things in there, right? So now the electronic medical record is accumulating a bunch of information from this patient journey. Of course, I would say that an intelligent EMR needs to collect all of this information far before they ever come to me, meaning if they've had a prior elevated lipid panel, if they've had a prior miscarriage, if they've had a prior whatever you can think of, a medication, an antibiotic, a psych medication, psych admission, hospitalizations for asthma, and now they're coming in to me with shortness of breath, many physicians will forget to ask about asthma when a patient comes in for shortness of breath. They're gonna say, oh, you probably have a cold, or the patient has a cold and they'll treat the cold, but they might forget to ask about asthma. Yes, many will hang the physician for saying that you're a bad physician for missing this, but in the moment, it's very easy to miss that because also the, many, many physicians will think like, How the hell could a patient forget to tell me that they had asthma and they were intubated once in an ICU? How can that be? It can be because that's normal. That's the stuff that happens. That's why healthcare needs a lot of healthy checks and balances so that things don't get missed, but also not so many alarms that the physician is going to completely ignore them or just be overwhelmed by them. So an electronic medical record that is intelligent will flag me at the end of right before I'm about to discharge the patient or close the chart and say this was a 75 year old gentleman who came in with shortness of breath right and they have never had any other medical problems been knowing the other issues you know um, maybe I don't know their oxygen level was good their pulse was good but maybe their blood pressure was low okay great or maybe the pulse was a little bit high Um, but their O2 level was normal. So maybe an electronic medical record can flag me and say, it looks like you gave them the diagnosis of just shortness of breath, or you gave them the diagnosis of cough, or you gave them the diagnosis of, I don't know, bronchitis, right? You know, statistically, the things that get missed that are really high risk for a patient like this is acute onset congestive heart failure, um, you know, valvulopathy, or uh, heart attack, you know, um, ischemic myocarditis versus myocarditis, whatever. So those are the things that easily get missed. And if I hover over any of these, then it might say the most effective thing you can do in this, knowing that you're in outpatient setting, right? The EMR has to be intelligent. Knowing that you are in the outpatient setting, one thing you could do is maybe document a normal uh, valve exam. A normal cardio, uh, heart exam and a pulmonary exam and get the JVD, etc. Or maybe consider an EKG or consider sending this patient to the ER if you're not able to get an EKG. Consider getting a chest x-ray if you're not able to do that. And maybe I then get the chest x-ray and I r- put the report in there, right? 
the, uh, the electronic medical record, if it's intelligent, can say, well, because the chest X-ray that you put in here is pretty normal, it's quite unlikely for this to be this, but it's still possible to be this. I say all of this not to complicate things and not to put, a, put the fear of lawsuit or whatever into a physician, but to demonstrate that an intelligent EMR can actually help prevent a really bad outcome. However, if this intelligent EMR is used for the purposes of just suing a doctor or forcing a doctor to order it, yes, of course, we won't even use it. Yes, it won't get adopted, right? Oh, I don't know if you guys could hear me. Uh, I, like, for example, let's say, let's say um, the EMR logs all of this stuff and it on the top right, right before I close it, it says, did you consider a pulmonary embolism? Did you consider acute congestive heart failure? And um, I saw it, I even hovered over it, I ignored it, I closed the chart. One in one million chance, one in 100,000 chance, the patient ended up having congestive heart failure, goes to the ER, gets admitted, see it, you know, severe CHF, gets into ICU, gets discharged, I get sued, patient complained, whatever. Will I then be in trouble because somebody is going to go look back and say, hey, the chart even flagged you and you didn't pay attention to it? No, right? That can't happen. That if, if we use that for that purpose, it defeats the purpose of keeping the clinician responsible in some ways to, to work with, with that system, right? Instead, what has to happen is, and that's kind of like the machine learning part of it, right? This isn't artificial intelligence. This is an intelligent EMR, meaning there's some algorithms that are programmed into it. Now, there's another part that a lot of people talk about, I think kind of the deep learning part, the machine learning part maybe of this system is that it can maybe learn that every time I have clicked away or I ignored this or in my patient population, uh, the outcome of this patient was bad or the outcome of this patient was X, Y, Z. So it will maybe put a stronger um, mark on the fact that it could be congestive heart failure. It might even to make it easier for me say, okay, I know you're about to click away from this, but if you just could get an EKG on them, if you could just check a hepatojugular uh, JVD, what is it? A jugular venous distension, look for jugular venous dis distension, a hepatojugular reflux, then you could at least have a 70% higher chance of this not being congestive heart failure, or at least consider sending this patient for cardiology, at least consider bringing this patient back with their PCP for further testing. That is intelligence. That is amazing. And um, yeah, that, that's nothing new to us, right? That's, that, as in what I'm trying to say is as in, as in somebody, you could take one physician to help program this for pretty much every single diagnosis. It really would not be that complicated. You are discharging the COPD patient without any inhaled uh, medication. You know, like, what are you doing? You're discharging this, uh, you have this congestive, chronic congestive heart failure patient, you don't have them on any ACE inhibitors. Do you want to reconsider that? Anything like that, anything like that where there's like, could you just maybe consider this because it will decrease their uh, uh, admission rate. Those of you who are physicians understand this. Those of you who aren't and are thinking that, oh, this is already in the making and they're working on it and this guy is going to create it. Oh, my buddy is working on an intelligent EMR. You're deluded. You're very deluded because that is not even... That is not even close to what we're working on. I know this because I've consulted for healthcare startups and uh, companies like this that are creating something supposedly like this. And I know the crazy difficult challenge that they have, majority of which is getting patient data to create this. Number two is interoperability. How can we even have something as big as Cerner or uh, Kaiser's Health Connect, which is based off of, what is it, um, whatever, you actually integrate this data and work because there is no government agency that is forcing anybody to do anything, which I'm not saying I'm a big fan of government agencies forcing this stuff, but there should be some aspect where this is integrated, where there, you know, you can still communicate with one central database where the information is going. Then number three, you got HIPAA, you got high tech, you got all these other rules and regulations, protected health information that is preventing us. That's literally crippling us, putting the fear in the patient that, oh, you know, if your acne diagnosis gets, you know, somehow published on the Internet, you're fucked. You're never going to get another job or no insurance company will ever take you, you know, crazy stuff like that. Um, Dr. Rishore, you mentioned that you saw a pediatric patient today. Do you not know what HIPAA is? You know, it's like, no, 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 that's, that, that wasn't the 
point of HIPAA, right? That wasn't the intention. <laughs> we weren't supposed to go backwards. So creating stuff like this is important. We did it with medication and it, I believe it backfired. I don't think it was useful. I don't think the EMR is intelligent to the user. I think the EMR just got programmed with a bunch of alarms to protect the EMR software designer. In fact, there was a big lawsuit right now for one of the EMRs because a referral or prescription didn't go through and because it didn't go through, it was the EMR's fault. You guys probably know about this. Um, and the way it was designed and programmed, so that now the EMR manufacturer or EMR designer uh, is held liable. I get that. This is a systems issue. This is a software problem. It also got missed in other ways. And like there are, there should be other ways to manage it. But just assigning blame and suing and that sort of stuff, if there is no moratorium on that, on this kind of behavior and this kind of action, it's going to be hard to move forward. And that is probably the number four and five together it's the kind of um, litigation nightmare that you're dealing with when you're trying to create an intelligent emr the way i think this is going to work is when you have private practices private individual physicians who are taking an emr and building some of these algorithm algorithms in place i think that can become super intelligent super useful and i think there can be some <clears throat> local machine learning uh, uh, you know like um, on a local network where you, there's less liability for the physician and that could become uh, very effective for the patient i think it could be maybe even built in some hospital systems or whatever but i'm not proposing solutions i'm just discussing the fact that it seems like here's something physicians know and here's the la la land that many other people are reading the internet and google and like they have their own ideas and it's like I, I as a physician who works mostly per diem i work in so many different healthcare settings i work with emrs you've never even heard of i work with crazy stuff and i'm like none of these have it none of these have it the only thing the only emr was like um uh, that, was, that was close to intelligent was like, oh, well, it l- looks like for every otitis media, you'd pr- prescribe amoxicillin. Really? Because like I can do that on all scripts. You know, I can do that on uh, Athena Health. Like I can click on otitis media and it's going to tell me amoxicillin. That's not intelligent. That's not, there's no intelligence there. That is, that is like the most basic of algorithms. And that's not going to be enough. That's not going to be enough. That's not going to help us. So again, not, not to, not to d- dive into the negativity, but really to focus on what it means to be an intelligent EMR, the difference between just flagging something and making a, making a physician just scared of something. Uh, and like, is this going to show up in court uh, and also adding liability? Or is this just going to be another like, oh, your amoxicillin is going to interact with methotrexate. You cannot prescribe amoxicillin with methotrexate, which is great, which is useful. But if that's all you're going to tell me and there's no other suggestion that you have and you don't really put it into context for me, it kills it. It, it really just makes me freeze in place because I <clears throat> may not know what else to do. All right, guys, that's it. Email me if you have any questions, drmo at Digital Nomad Physicians. If you have any questions, go to digitalnomadphysician.com, top right, consult. If you'd like to talk to me, that's it. Take care.